so estrogen, estrogen TRT, um, it's a common topic, uh, lots of madness around it, information, misinformation, lots of opinions. So if you want to find out some balanced views and, and some views of, um, of uh, Nelson Virgil and Dr. George Tuliatos, keep watching. Hi guys, so we're back with another video and today is one of these controversial topics, but I know we'll just sort of keep it balanced and, and discuss it, but uh, this this estrogen madness is, is something that sort of, uh, you know, is probably going to be around for forever, as, as Nelson said in, um, in in TRT. We hear lots of things about estrogen, that it's that it's bad. I mean, we obviously had those studies where it was observational and the, the, that reference range for target range for estrogen came out before people realized it was sort of guys with low testosterone and it doesn't apply to giving people, you know, TRT and those studies didn't block estrogen. And we've got people saying that it's, it needs to be as high as possible and, and it, it needs to be crushed and, and aromatase inhibitor use and things like that. So what are your guys' views on estrogen in general? And then obviously estrogen with trt and should it be managed versus um you know is it something that should be blocked well we, we, we have we agree in some things we have some things in common so i'm a fan of estrogens and i first wrote in the significance of estrogenic environment in bodybuilding for bill welling five years ago and when john chris already in the first place so the guy says if i took your dose of on and peed out again on the water it was estrogen he told me that the assumption is the conclusion that you you sound like you should change something good, which is not actually. So I told him it's up to, I mean, there are beneficial estrogens for mood, for cognitive function, for endothelial uh, function also, for joint health, uh, for uh, uh, libido also, for sex drive, for bone mineral density. Uh, the point is, it's about also optimization in every case and a balance, okay? So crash on estrogens, and especially if you are not symptomatic, just follow the labs without any symptoms of tissue tenderness in, in, in mammary glands or gynecomastia, of course. I think it's, it's, it's prohibited, it's not obligatory to use an aromatase inhibitor, even though there is a paranoia now against the aromatase inhibitor. So each case is different. And of course, men need estrogens, but also crashing on estrogens like in bodybuilding in order to look super dry before the show is also catastrophic for the endothelial dysfunction, you know, for sex drive, for more fragile bones, for cracking joints, uh, for um, cognitive function. And we know that women live more than men because the, the, the protective role of estrogen is in, in, in arteries and in cardiovascular health, and of course in endothelium. So we have to go uh, not just by the lab work, but also uh, follow um, a medical history and ask the patient, you have also elevated prolactin, also perhaps IGF-1 elevated, low DHT that has also an antiestrogenic effect plays a role. So it's multifactorial, but just watching a three digital estradiol doesn't give you the whole idea. So unless you're not symptomatic, you shouldn't uh, use necessarily an aromatase inhibitor. However, we have to know that estrogens may be prethrombotic, okay? So we, I think that women that abuse contraceptive pills and elevate their estrogens, they had a higher tendency for some clotting and deep venous thrombosis. The new generation of contraceptive pills uh, do not elevate that much estrogens rather than progesterone. But uh, of course, men need estrogens. They're not just a female hormone. So I believe it's about balance and optimization and also clinical symptoms along with uh, data on the paper. Right, Nelson, what were your thoughts? That's a great summary. I'm so glad I, you started this discussion because you summarized, you saved me a lot of time. Um, 100% agree, I mean, with George. Um, and let me expand on that. Why, why, is this going, why is this going on? And this is a, a trend that started, I would have to say, in the United States. And it started this use of an astrosol. And it really started and it still is prevalent in the cash, we call it the cash business, the clinics that don't take insurance. Insurance doesn't, doesn't insurance companies don't pay for an astrosol for men. That's a breast cancer drug. That's their number one indication. Um, 
So uh, it really, and it's been going on for a long time. I, I wrote the book in 11 years ago. Uh, I would add 20 more years. So at least 30 years or more, we've been having this discussion about estrogen. The only thing that has changed, and I say estrogen, when in fact this estrogen has three components, estradiol, E1, E2, you know, and, e, and estradiol is really the most abundant, the one we have all the data from. The other ones are very minor, although I'm not saying they're not important. They just don't have enough data on men. Um, so we measure estradiol. Dr. Chrysler was one of the first ones, um, maybe, I don't know, 15 years ago or 12, that brought up the fact that the testing of regular testing with immunoassay was overestimating estradiol in men. So that was a good thing to learn. We, we sell the sensitive test here, which is based on liquid chromatography. So that's, that was one thing we needed to, to, to address. But why are clinics uh, prescribing this thing even at the beginning of a TRT, like right away, they, they, there's a cookie cutter program here in the States, uh, uh, one milligram twice a week or half a milligram twice a week of an astrosol, uh, HCG, whatever the use of those 500, I use twice a week, and testosterone 100 to 200 milligrams twice a week. Those three are the cookie cutter programs that I would say 80% of clinics online, cash clinics in the United States, and there are probably over 1,500 clinics in the United States to 2,000. The more I dig, the more I find. And every week, there's one opening up like a Starbucks. So that's what they do. And what they're doing is they're copying their protocol from other clinics. So there is no verification. There's no, hey, is this the right thing to do? And men obviously hear the word estrogen, and they hear the word you know, female. I don't want to be a woman. I don't want to have men up, uh, you know, the, the symptoms of muscle menstruation. So there's this obviously uh, feeling that it's always going to be there. I mean, like women, some women hear the word testosterone and they co correlate to aggressive aggressiveness to all, all that is strong in the world to, you know, in fact, is they need testosterone too, like we need estrogen. So there is a psychological, philosophical thing going on there that it's going to be there forever. I have to say, the, more, the only thing that has changed is that we have seen more and more data, more and more studies looking at the role of estrogen in men. George basically summarized all the benefits. Um, so why are they, are they still prescribing this thing? The main thing, I think there are two misconceptions that I see is people equate water retention right away with estrogen. And they don't even test it. They just start, you know, that, that first correlation or link is what's the problem because it really usually is not the case but it is what they believe the second belief is if their nipples are starting to get sensitive they think they're going to get gynecomastia you know, which is increase of breast tissue so that's uh maybe partly true but not true all the time because there's increased sensitivity in the nipple area in a lot of men that don't develop gynecomastia so those two things are assumptions they are driving I think in my point of view. The third one is ED, erectile function. They, they correlate ED with high estrogen or high estradiol. Which, Duration of the erection actually. So uh, in, if your erection is not, does not last for quite, perhaps they, they are super high. Yeah. So there are these three assumptions with very little data or very little blood work, because usually people don't run the test in the clinic zone. Um, so that, those are the three things that are driving this craziness. And there's a fourth one, which is a psychological aspect. What we know is the evolution, we had the cascade, like a, we were talking in other videos, where you know we start from cholesterol go all the way down to testosterone. Testosterone doesn't stop there. There's DHT, 10% of testosterone becomes the hydrotestosterone. It's linked to, you know, libido is linked to some of it, also the acne, the side effects, but DHT has a role. And then there's 0.4%, tiny little bit of testosterone that gets converted into estradiol. And why is nature doing that? Well, George described all the benefits why estro estradiol. Testosterone really, testosterone really is a pro-hormone of DHT yes, and estradiol. Yes, but if you so, cut off DHT because of prostatin lover or hair thinning, you increase the rate to aromatization. Well, DHT also, you know, uh, opposes estradiol, you know, so the more DHT, so there's a balance. Yes. Every single part of the tree or the cascade is a balanced game, right? So the only the thing, and I'm an engineer, so I'm a numbers guy, and the thing I have a problem with, and I know one day this will be solved, because all we need is a good IT uh, coder 
and computer uh, WIS that will just put these numbers together into a matrix. Because we tend to see one number at a time. We say, oh, just stuff and so just No, it should be everything. How is the source related to a stroke? How thyroid, thyroid function is working? So it is not a decision based on one number. Every decision on hormone balance should be about hormone balance. Yes. In my point of view, and there are, very, there are only two or three studies on the ratio of testosterone to estradiol. Some of them uh, obviously are using the, long, the old test. Uh, there may be some accuracy issues, but they say, you know, uh, ratio. And when I say ratio, we're using different units in the United States than you guys in the EU. And nanograms per deciliter divided by picograms per milliliter should be 14 or above for at least the studies are shown since seeing um, um, sperm count production, anything below that. So the ratio of testosterone and estradiol are probably, is probably even the most important thing that you're saying. And I can say this because I, I sell blood tests and, and the ranges of testosterone, normal ranges and normal ranges of estradiol that have been determined by the LabCorp Corporation, the, one of its lab, lab testing companies, and Quest Diagnostics, based on their database, data set, not based on anything else, that say, for instance, uh, Quest has a maximum of 28 picograms of estradiol, but their data set is mostly men not on testosterone. Men on TRT are not the regular people used in their data sets of these determinations. So I would say 90% of men that come to the scanner labs have high testosterone, because obviously they're on DRT. They have high estradiol, obviously, because 0.4% of this converts into this. And they're freaking out because their number is in a red, out of range, high estradiol. So that psychologically, it's like, oh my God, give me an astrosol. When in fact is, wait a minute, your testosterone is 1,200, not like in the studies, most studies were 350. So this range does not pertain to you. Well, should, be one tenth, should be one tenth of it, E2 than total T? At least, or, or you know. So you is, it true, is it true, Nelson, that those ranges refer to women and not in men? Let's be Ooh. below 60 picograms. There is very, yeah, because what we're using in the States now more, more than anything is a sensitive test, which is based on liquid chromatography, mass spectrometry. That test basically was developed for women and for uh, pediatrics too. And obviously we're starting to use it in men. So, so yeah. it doesn't but, apply to us in DRT. <laughs> no, and it doesn't apply to anybody with testosterone because I would say, when have you seen a man on TRT unless you're using a gel that has 500 nanograms? I would say some, and usually using Android gel, one of the gels or creams, but most men injecting testosterone, and this is my experience and I have good, obviously I cannot disclose the data because there's HIPAA requirements, privacy, but I have good, I can say with a good, maybe I'm probably the only one in the field that can say that. 90% of the guys, and there are really thousands of tests tested through these counter labs, have over a thousand nanograms per deciliter, which is above the range of testosterone because LabCorp and, and Quest say you, I think their top 950 is one. So, so yes, out of range of testosterone, you should be out of range on estradiol. Does that mean you have to treat estradiol? No as long as the, that ratio can say, but we have no data on the ratio. There's only, I have to say it was a beautifully done study. I analyzed it, I have a video on my YouTube channel, Excel Mail. The only study that actually suppressed testosterone on purpose, they gave them a, a testosterone blocker that is used for prostatic cancer. And they added testosterone or an astrosol to several groups. And they actually saw the, 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 the curve on how many people their, you know, their, their DHT and their, their estradiol and they were able actually to correlate. Obviously, there's a correlation there. I, I showed it in the video. So as long as we are cl close to that correlation, there's balance. If you don't have gynecomastia, and I would say, this is something I do have to admit, anybody who had gyno when they were younger or when they were bodybuilding would always be afraid of estradiol. I don't discount that. I think they, you know, they, they maybe have a reason too. But that subset of patients will always use an astrosol because they're afraid to, for it to come back, even the ones that had surgery uh, to remove the glands. But most men do not need an astrosol um, because really, unless you're seeing a ratio of you know, 10 
or below 14, where this estrogen uh, is so high that the ratio is going down, obviously it's T divided by two. But I'm just speculating because there are no strong data on that. I'm a data What guy. about tamoxifen instead, which is less, it's more friendly to the lipids and to the well, bone. Tamoxifen is an IGF-1 blocker too. I okay, mean, then yeah, it may suppress cancer also, but uh, when it's already gyno established, it's preferably to use yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. ER blocker because the floating issues you cannot sit up on the receptor. Okay. Yeah. Tamoxifen is definitely the first. Let me ask you, there was a case of a bodybuilder who was blasting one gram of testosterone and his isodial was 500. Asymptomatic, totally. No removal of the gland, but asymptomatic. Now, what do you do there? Just for the sake of prethrombotic effect, you have to lower at least 100 the histodial or leave it to 500 and then maybe he had a stroke and then you feel guilty about it. <laughs> hey, George, you have one, you wrote one of the best articles and you mentioned it. Yeah, man, article. but this is a, it's um, outrageous. 500 is a dial, it's, it's crazy, it's crazy. Well, you know, I mean, his, his hematocrit okay? His, you know, yes, his, it's fine, it was 45. <laughs> The dementary uh, rate is the sedimentation rate, okay? I mean, uh, his platelets, okay? There are many factors involved in, in thrombosis, right? And there's some obviously genetic factors, you know, like factor five and all that. So, you know, you wrote probably the best paper back in the days on the, the, the benefit of estrogen, estradiol in bodybuilding. Well, this is debatable. How high? We don't know. Do you remember Dr. Have... Ramazani? Do you remember Dr. Ramazani? Oh, yeah, but you know. We do not know how high, let's say you have a thousand nanograms. What is that in, in, in your uh, nanomolars? Uh, 28, 30? About 30, yeah, 30. Below, 40, below 60 is the range. So let's say 30 in testosterone in, in the EU. You have 30 testosterone. How much should be the highest estradiol level? Just 0.04 of that. Point, you know, it's 0.04. Okay, I have a thousand, let's say. Mm -hmm. Multiply that by, you know, by 0.04. That should be and then convert it to the estradiol units that you guys use in the EU. So it, I did it, you know, on Excel now I have a table. About 120 Excel. picomolar per liter. I have an Excel sheet on Excel mail where I, you know, just to predict a 0.04, uh, because that's what nature wants, wants to, us to have and what they predicted. And this study actually measured the actual levels of different doses of testosterone on estradiol and plotted it. Obviously, there's wide variations because everybody's different. There's fat content is different, ages were a little different, but there is a correlation and there's a plateau also that occurs at higher, higher doses of testosterone where estradiol and DHT plateau. So the answer to your question is nobody has really determined what is the highest, what is the ratio that will lead to thrombosis, you know, Especially mm. all the other If you smoke, also, you know. So you know, do we uh, is 0.5 milligrams of nitrosol a week bad for you? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's bad for people. The only thing that can change is lipids, but and bone density. Every single study I've seen is like a milligram at a time. That's 48 times too much of a drug. Think of every drug you've ever used. If you administer 48 times the recommended dosage. Are you going to get a good outcome? So saying that the Ranges inhibitor is a poison is like saying don't drink water because people are drunk in it. That makes no sense with you. Yes, and I've heard some doctors say we shouldn't even measure estradiol uh, on the blood tests uh, at all. But, you know, it's a useful tool that we see, you know, when someone's starting TRT. Uh, to see if they are deficient in estradiol, which may be leading to bone loss due to their low testosterone and also some of the effectiveness of, of their conversion once, once on TRT. So I just thought I might, might address that, see what you thought, Nelson. See, see well, I asked actually, this is going to be, this is an interesting anecdote that I have. Yeah. I have two friends that are very close to me. They're doctors. They have a large practice of testosterone. I'm going to mention names. And... Obviously, they're very well read, very educated. I, I admire them a lot. And I asked one of them, why are you still prescribing an astrosol at those, you know, 0.5 twice a week at baseline? You're not even waiting for to test people at week 12. He says, Nelson, because if I don't, my work is harder. They will be complaining in those first weeks that they have high estrogen. They will be emailing, calling the clinic. And I just my workload will increase by twice as much 
because they read on the internet or they watch this video from somebody that is fear mongering or whatever it is. So I just do it now. And I just hope, you know, maybe long-term follow up that you know, they don't crash it so that one, obviously I'll, I'll remove the dosing back then, but I have to prove to them. And I cannot, if I stop prescribing it, my workload will increase dramatically because mm -hmm. of the complaints. Hey, that gave me an answer. That really explained the whole thing to me. So. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. Does high estradiol favor higher HDL and lower LDL? <laughs> yeah. This is a good... Yeah, uh, good. Point, yeah. I mean, look at women. I mean, they have beautiful HDLs compared to us. And most, and, it, and testosterone, all androgens decrease HDL, you know, affect lipids. Yes, so, yes. Abusing the uh, testosterone will lower your HDL. You're bringing an astrosol in to a radius situation where HDL is low and we can we can go for an hour. That could be a whole nother topic because there have been studies <laughs> with uh, torsotrib on raising HDL and some people died in the study. So does having high HDL actually uh, well, improve heart health? health. That's so that's partly another. Partly due to, this, to the actual drug that was given too. So actually LDL is more important than HDL. The particle size is really what's, what matters, you know. It, it's so, more protective. That, than that would be a good video. I'd like to go into like the particle size and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Like, we got to have a cardiologist on board. Yeah, actually, we've got um, really Dr. Gupta. Gupta. Dr. Gupta, we could do one with oh, him. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. All I'm saying it's not black and white. I, I'm saying that definitely I don't think anybody needs one milligram a week unless you're one of those uh, poor souls that has low T, uh, high H. You know, IG, IGF-1 has been linked, high IGF-1. A lot of guys on growth hormone. And prolactin, of, prolactin. Uh, obviously, hyperlactin, but and low DHT also, yes. So you Actually, by taking an aromatase inhibitor, you increase the HT, and perhaps this increase to better sex drive and to hardness in the physique. That's what bodybuilders at, at least they do. They take two milligrams of an astrozole at 1 a.m., 1 p.m. before the show to harden up, you know, and look more dry. And you increase it, actually the DHT, and that's why hair thinning occurs. This is uh, DHT decreases with obviously increases when uh, you know so that all goes out. It's how you know you go up and down. Together. Yeah. I mean, you do uh, if you use anabar and sort of oxanolone, you're basically blocking a lot of this so that will through increase the DHT. But and you you've written about that too. But I do have to say that we are overdoing it in this field. Yeah. Um, we will not know the consequences until long term. Uh, maybe we'll. I'm 61, so obviously I haven't taken an astrosol but once and didn't really. Do you check it out? How much is it regularly? Uh, my DEXA scan, you mean on bone? Oh, no, I mean, uh, you so check that, out. I, I'm one of those guys that tends to run low. I mean, my 20s, you know, even though my testosterone. But not anymore? A thousand, yeah. yeah I, I actually, uh, yeah, I never had. So I think it's, there's some genetics involved in estradiol. Some guys tend to go higher than others. We haven't looked at that. There's actually some studies on men that have aromatase. Uh, uh, mutations in the aromatase gene, and they have a study those guys. Those are a good model to look at. Uh, what happens to them? The, the only thing that changes in their case is the bone density. So you know, will a lot of these guys in their twenties taking an astrosol weekly will reach my age at sixty-one and have fractures? I guess we'll have to wait and see. I wouldn't want to take that chance. I do see a lot of guys. I mean, if you type, if you Google crashed estrogen or crash estradiol excelmail.com they're probably over 500 posts on men that are freaking out because they estradiol. feel fatigued the next day they fatigue they lose interest in sex they lose uh, penile sensitivity they don't feel anything in their penis they feel drained because, yes yeah so so there's such a thing as crashing so we i think we all agree that's not everything right yeah. it, the, the question really is how high is too high the how low is too low we have data 20 milligrams or below you will pay the consequences on mostly bone density and all that. So we don't have an issue there. It's how high is too high. Some guys on the internet are saying you should never treat. But Ron McLean believes between when it's that was between I think 20 or 60 is the best exercise now. But it depends on your testosterone level. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, correct. So, so it, you cannot say to somebody who has 500 nanograms and should have the same estradiol as somebody yes. has 500. Yes. So that's yeah. my problem. We are using not only the wrong test, we're using the wrong range, we're, we're scaring guys. Um, people, clinics are giving an astrosol at the first visit before even measuring it later. 
um, any of oh, this thing about water retention being a wrong assumption, this thing about, oh, my nipples are sensitive, give me the damage and as result. A lot of assumptions. I don't think this is going away. This is going to be with us for years. So it should as be proportional. Even if, as we generate more data and data is coming a lot. Every two months, I see a study on the benefits of estrogen in men. Uh, but nobody's talking about how high is too high. <laughs> so we need to do like a study that is being done already on blocking estrogen is actually giving men estrogen, which, hey, people say, oh, how dare you? They you said once that they don't with prostate cancer. They, they do it in prostate cancer patients. They have two yes. studies, but they gave them estrogen to see if they actually they preserve their bones. And they some of them felt better quality of life. So and also they believe estrogens are protective against COVID. That's why men, uh, women have less mortality frequency yeah. in COVID. Oh, I don't, well, I don't touch that subject, well, what about um, here's an experiment? What about uh, trans men, or is it right the uh, men that, that convert to, uh, to the, no, trans transgender women, men yeah, that convert the, that that uh, transition into women? Those those have been looked at. We have a lot more data on F2M, which is female to male, um, mostly on the cardiovascular aspects of it, and actually it's pretty um, pretty amazing that obviously their lipids go to hell because you know women have good yeah. lipids. Obviously, given testosterone to convert them into males. And I had a case from Israel. There was a lady that uh, wanted to, she was using a beetle, and I told you, just, you can also add some provider on top of it. And uh, actually, in, in women, the, the steroids have opposite effect in insulin resistance. So it, they elevate insulin resistance, like in men, but they decrease. So it's tricky, yes. And the lipids yeah. also, yes. Polycystic ovary syndrome. Yes, yes. Have high testosterone. But, Those ladies have high testosterone. DHA also, DHA. And yeah. one, of the, one of the treatments is metformin, is it not for um, polycystic ovaries? And, you know, and uh, a losterone blocker, you know. Yes, yes, in, yes, to, for so, yes. So the question, the answer, the clear answer to those guys watching the video that are sick and tired of gray zone areas or like me and yeah. most, is that we don't know how high is too high. All we know is that the range should not apply to everybody. The range that labs, lab, labs show are based on, on men with lower testosterone or like George said, females um, that freaking out because you have a high estradiol when you have a high testosterone may not be uh, necessary. Um, that you will, uh, it is good to measure estradiol. Uh, I think if you're an older person like me, uh, over 40, 50, you should do a DEXA scan, which is a, it not only gives you information on muscle and fat, but also bone density. I think it's, it's a good thing. I, I'm, I think my DEX is good. Um, if you're having sensitivity issues where you're, you don't feel anything in your penis, maybe you should look at the fact that your cell is too low. Uh, guys are using HCG for that purpose on Excel mail. I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm a, I try to be like a guy knows it all. I don't try to, I'm repeating the things I'm reading and not only reading once, because you know, things once is an end of one is, is really not a good, but I'm, I'm seeing what's being repeated. And obviously there's a lot of dogma and, and opinions when in fact is we have no data on how high is too high. We know that nature has created this thing where, you know, 0.4%, uh, 0.4.5, 0.4 of testosterone converts for any reason that evolution decided. Do we- I remember when I was hypogonadic and I had a testosterone of 100, 150, my sodal was low because there was not enough testosterone to convert. And I had the, you know, so it's proportional actually. Yeah, the more you right. use, the more the conversion, but it's better to have a high testosterone with the same estradiol than a low testosterone. It's oh yeah. The ratio, yeah. yeah. The ratio really. The ratio, and, yeah. You know, and, and, and like the, there was a good study on teenagers and the IGF-1 was the number one factor, high IGF-1. IGF-1 is a growth factor. So if so you so use DH and that elevates spikes, IGF-1, it's more likely to, to have a tissue tenderness, huh? Yes. So, you know, so I don't know, did we, did we blabber too much or are we, we do, do we need more clarification in a subject that may not be clear, clear enough? Because we don't have, the how high is too high question has never been answered. He has it. I, I would have read the study. But if it's too high, it's it's better testosterone to be high also. Oh, it has to be yeah. for the ratio to be maintained at 14. Otherwise, if it's low, you oh. screw it up. 
that's when that's, you, that's when that's you where they I think there was a study like a JAMA study where they you know with a 20 in America the 20 to 30 picograms per mil target range came from for a while where guys were giving TRT were like we got to get in this range and it was actually looking at guys with sort of I think it was like end stage heart failure and they just looked at their estrogen and their the guys that were sort of outside of this range had higher mortality rates but that's not it actually turns out their testosterone was rather poor so it's is it doesn't apply to somebody who's in a good healthy state you know yeah. with good testosterone and like the ratios and things but so. they failed to mention that these 325 nanograms was their average testosterone in that group and they had a history of heart disease mm. so and they say well if you have more than i thought it was 40 or 35 picograms you have higher chances of, of cardiovascular uh, you know uh, uh, and, you know risks which in fact is nobody mentioned the fact that they were low testosterone. Their ratio, their testosterone to estradiol ratio was low. So, mm -hmm. and that study was the one that drove everything. And the Life Extension Foundation wrote this huge article on that. And that was what, 15, 17 years ago. And that started this craze. And everybody refers to the study that was poorly done. So man, you know, I, if there's a topic where, um, I don't even write about it anymore. This is the first video I've done on Israel for long because I'm tired of it. Because unless you bring me uh, more data and hopefully the lift should study, lift, the only way to prove this is to give men on TRT estrogen. And no, so you believe that synthetic to, to you believe that, that those guys, huh? You believe Sorry? that synthetic DHT, so provirum sterilum, uh, can uh, help with the tissue tenderness and perhaps lower the effects yeah, dht blocks estra, you know estrogen receptors it has an so estrogenic effect yeah, we don't have it in the states it's a you know the providing is not is not fda approved it's in mexico oh okay. yeah dht dst blocks es estrogen and it can probably increase libido so i would rather if i had a real problem i would rather take a dht analog even oxalone uh or you know providing than an estrosol because I don't think uh, proviron has an effect on bone density and it may actually increase your yes. libido. So no, it's just that we don't have it in the States. We don't even have the DHT gel that you guys used to have in Germany or something because it's, it's not approved. A, a compounding pharmacy cannot make a DHT cream in the United States. We and also not. taking a blocking DHT by finasteride and testosterone, and it, it makes you look more smooth and puffy because E2 elevates. Huh? Really? Finasteride? Like the, really? I think so, yes, because uh, DHT has this hardening effect and you look drier. But to take finasteride, you mean? You look drier? No, no. Oh, sorry. the opposite. If you, if oh, okay, you okay, okay, okay. I was like, what? You have the, the other, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, I'm not in bodybuilding, so uh, you, you were and you are. So um, maybe there is such a thing as an astrosol making you look high, uh, harder and drier and your water retention. You know, all I know is that I've... Uh, that is, I think that that you know you failed to mention that they take diuretics and they're on a yeah. keto and they're on a keto low carb diet. You know, so what what is it? What, and what also too many androgens that burn the fat. Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Oxanolone, you know, is a DHT blocker too. It's a you know estrogen blocker. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a DHT analog. So they're taking a combo of, you know, potential right. um, water uh, excretors things that decrease your water content. Uh, and obviously after they, they have a content, they almost crash because of that. But, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not an expert on the subject. You are, George, so. <laughs> but also insulin, you said eating more carbs and insulin spikes makes you look puffier and smoother. Yes, that's, that's yeah, 100%. We, I think the world agrees on that. Carbs and insulin are, 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 are tend to increase the incidence of water retention. Uh, although, as I said, it's used in bodybuilding because of that same reason, you know, you're more, mm, yes. you have more muscle mass and you look more pumped. So anyway, so we can hey. go on further. I don't know, have we covered or is this being too I think much we have, yeah. I mean, it's nice to have this sort of view on it because it, usually it's, uh, you've got one person being very dogmatic about something. And like you say, from what I've seen, it is, there isn't evidence to support it fully either way. Um, and it's usually, it seems a little bit of scaremongering. And then you've got another person completely contradicting so it's, yeah, it's nice to sort of have a balanced view on you know the evidence that's there things that show this and maybe more is to come and, and like you say when the evidence comes out we'll have a clearer picture on you know how high is, is too high um, but it's also nice to know 
things like that study I mentioned that you explained really well, Nelson, that, you know, that's what drove that target range because that's still out there. Those sorts of things, lots of um, some poorly done studies that then were applied to people on TRT and people still use that. And it, it can be scary. There's a lot of anxiety around TRT as a treatment, let alone the misinformation or you know, could call it the different views that are out there. So, yeah, that was good. Thank you very much, guys. That was awesome. You're welcome. Brilliant. Well, thank you, guys. That, that's uh, it's been a great summary. Um, so is there anything else to add, guys? Do you think there's anything else? No. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, good luck. Uh, I'm very excited with the European Union. You guys are definitely leaders. George has always been a super leader. In, uh, it all started from here, huh? I have to tell you. Uh, that's an old, old, old newspaper. One day, my dream is that this COVID thing is over, right? We all get whatever it is, vaccinated. And I get to fly to at least the UK. And yes, yes. yes. Or to Mykonos, huh? <laughs> a personal, a Mykonos and a personal actually a lecture there with all of you guys. I'm sure you guys like yeah, that. sure. Uh, Done deal. Let's hope for that, man. All right, you guys take care, okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Cheers. So thanks for, for joining us, guys, today. Um, it's been really helpful and if you guys like these videos please like subscribe uh, ring the notification bell and comment underneath if you've got questions or, or you'd like to uh, uh, to get involved so yeah thanks for watching and uh, we'll see you soon